Good morning. Last week we left off on the bittersweet note of the death of Stephen. It's bittersweet because from the human perspective it's tragedy. But we also saw the the beautiful part of it, how precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. It is uh, difficult for us to understand that. But by faith, Stephen understood it even as the rocks were hitting him. And this idea of faith and and looking forward uh, is also going to be found and woven through all the writings of the Apostle Paul. And yet he was one that was sitting there holding the cloaks of those. He wasn't participating in it, but he was approving of it. And yet we read in his words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Those beautiful words that he was writing toward the end of his own life. Are, are a verbalization of what was going on in Stephen's mind uh, when he looked up and he saw the Lord Jesus there, in, in essence, reaching now, waiting to receive him uh, into his presence. It's a beautiful scene. But today we're going to start looking at uh, why uh, the Apostle Paul called himself the chief among sinners. We're going to see that next threat. In fact, It's not only an external threat to the church, but it is an intensification of pretty much the low-level persecution that the church was uh, experiencing. It it was primarily at this point on uh, a few of the apostles, then it became all of the apostles. Now it is going to be uh, the church. They were gathering uh, daily in the temple there on Solomon's portico, as, as we have a couple of instances telling us. But this is a rather large group. And so Jerusalem is a, is a big city for their time, uh, but they were in house to house. They were meeting amongst themselves. They were uh, daily going about their lives, but they were also gathering there in the temple. Now, this was uh, uh, something that was very common in the, the Jewish life, especially when you lived there in Jerusalem, because there was the time of prayer. There was the coming and going that was naturally a part of the Jews' life. So it it wasn't something extraordinary in that sense for many of them. They were used to being able to go to the temple, but now they were over off to the side. They were gathered as a group, and they were hearing the gospel. We know that some of the priests now were converting, uh, even before Stephen's stoning. Uh, and so, you know, they were there in and around the, the temple as well, and they were going over and listening. They were seeing these signs and miracles and wonders. They knew the things that were, were going on, and many of them came to faith. What was it going to take for the Pharisee Saul of Tarsus? Because he, too, was one of the people that was in and around what was going on. But he was determined to snuff it out. He was going after what we're going to see in just a moment are the people of the way. Now let's take just a little side detour here and consider that idea for a moment. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that, that idea of the way not only points to Christ, but it also points to the teaching of Christ where he says that um, the, the road is narrow, narrow, difficult is the way to life. And so all of those are uh, embodied in not only the the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ, but the body of Christ. It is the way that we should go. It is uh, your teacher is going to come behind you, as Isaiah said in chapter 30, and he is going to say, this is the way, walk in it. And so all of that is brought to mind, and it was a very natural way of expressing who the church is. Uh, you know, They didn't have signs out at the street uh, in the sense that so many have denominated the church. And we have to be careful when we put a sign out there uh, that says the church of Christ, that we aren't denominating ourselves, that it is not a naming. It's a statement of ownership. It is Christ's church. It is his. It is his body. It is that which he, the redeemed, that he purchased with his own blood. So when we see this name, it's absolutely fine. If we had it outside the, the church building here, simply the way on Timber Lane, you know, all of that, let's not get bogged down in names on the sign. 
Let's understand who we are. And let's make sure that we are actually members of the way and not joining a social club. All of these things uh, should, should be ever-present in our mind as we're looking back into the history of the, the early days of the church and then understanding who we are and, and analyzing who we are uh, in our day and our age. So we have verse uh, 1 of chapter 8 that tells us that Saul approved of the execution and there arose a great persecution against the, the church. And so Stephen is buried and then Saul is going to step to the forefront. But as he does, this scattering could have killed the church, but it didn't. Why? Because of that same cycle. There are threats to the church that are followed by peace and growth. Jesus told the people, go, therefore. What's the therefore? All authority has been given to me on heaven, uh, in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe thing, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. That commission to go and preach the gospel and to, to harvest those who come to faith and are immersed into Christ for salvation that great commission is what we're going to see here. Jesus told the apostles, you're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and into all of Judea and into Samaria and then into all the uttermost parts of the earth. And now we see the scattering. It took a persecution to scatter. They should have already been on the way, but they also should have already been preaching to the Gentiles. And we're going to see in chapter 10 that it took a lot for Peter to finally get to that point. We're going to see in, in chapter 15 that there's contention over that. We resist what God has clearly called us to do. And we need to be wary of that. We need to be uh, inwardly um, introspective and we need to challenge ourselves. But we also need to be outwardly examining not only our lives, but challenging one another to assure that we're doing what God has called us to do. And no matter what challenges come, whether from inside the church or from outside, that he will give that growth and he will give us spiritual prosperity and that he will give us peace even in the midst of turmoil. Verse 4 of chapter 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. That's amazing. Because they didn't forget what their commission was. They were so filled with joy. This was now a part of their lives. It wasn't just something they did on Sunday mornings for an hour, maybe two if you include a Sunday school class. This was part of them, and they were now scattered. But it did not discourage them. It propelled them to do what they were told to do. So, so now we meet Philip. Well, we've already met him in chapter 6. He was identified there along with Stephen as those seven men uh, who the apostles laid hands on. They were charged with the daily distribution of bread. And now he's scattered. Now he can't do the distribution anymore. But he can do signs and miracles and wonders. And he goes and he begins to preach. And his ministry is, is phenomenal. And his ministry is impactful. But it's also very instructive. And what we learned about him, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and notice this and saw the signs that he did. The miracles are not miracles for the sake of miracles. It's not God putting on a show. Hey, look what I can do. It's not these men going forward and saying, hey, look at this magic act. No, this is God drawing attention to the word. The miracles confirm the word. Remember Nicodemus again. He comes to Jesus at night. We know that you are a teacher come from God because no one could do the signs that you do unless God had sent him. That same reality and that same understanding of these miracles is what pervades the narrative of the book of Acts. We don't need to get bogged down in, in the fact that we are not currently doing these miracles. The word has been provided for us. 
and it, it stands on its own now. It is its own confirmation. But we do preach these signs and teach these signs. We did not witness Jesus uh, doing these wonders. We did not witness the apostles doing these wonders. But these miracles, these signs and these wonders stand as a witness to this very day, only in the form of Scripture. Do you believe that they happened? Do you disbelieve that they happened? Because if you believe that they happened, then you might as well have seen them. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Did Peter raise people from the dead? Did Paul raise people from the dead? We need to ask ourselves these questions because if they did, then the Holy Spirit has confirmed the word, the message that they preached. And he's doing so here with Philip. So they're paying attention to him. They're amazed. They saw the signs that he did. Unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so that there was much joy. So now we see the healings. They're producing joy. They're getting people's attention. Things are going on. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic arts in the city and amazed the people of Samaria. So he was a magician. He practiced the magic arts. He could fake these things. But watch what it uh, does to him. Um, uh, they were saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. But Simon knew he was a fraud. He knew that he was a charlatan. He knew that he was doing tricks, and these were not real. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip and heard him preach the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. First point, there are no children here. We need to understand that that concept of baptism is truly by faith. It's for people that can not only hear, but can understand the gospel. The gospel call is for those who are condemned under sin. And children are innocent, but men and women are hearing the word and they're being baptized. So even after the external threat uh, to the church of this persecution, now there is growth that is coming. There's peace, there's joy that is coming as a result of the dispersion. And we see this growth uh, coming here. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, they continued with Philip. And seeing these great signs and miracles performed, he was amazed. This is an, uh, really an, an amazing uh, recognition here on, on Simon's part because he knows what he does and he knows how he accomplishes, but he sees the genuine article in these men. And now comes the internal threat. Now comes something from within. Uh, Philip has preached the gospel. These people are being added to the church. Simon himself uh, believed, and after being baptized, Simon was added to the church. There's a lot of people that look at this and say, well, no, 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 you know, he, he was, it wasn't really real. No, um, he, like everyone else, uh, was baptized into Christ. What we do after that is equally important because obeying the gospel is obeying the death. We die to ourselves. We die to sin. It is obeying the burial of Christ. We are immersed into Christ. Then according to Romans chapter 6, it is at that moment that God unites us with Christ and then raises us again with the same powerful work that he raised Christ from the dead. But we must also obey the resurrection because we must remain faithful even unto death. And whether that was the death of a martyr or whether that's a natural death at the end of a long life or anything in between, we must obey the resurrection of Christ and that new man, having put off the old, that new man that walks in newness of life. And so we have uh, one who has been washed clean of his sins and he, he stumbles pretty quickly in that new walk and it is a threat. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem had heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to him Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Notice the distinction here. Being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, that is the earnest measure of the Spirit, 
the indwelling of the Spirit that was found in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, that promises to all, even all those who are far off, as many as uh, God shall call. This is the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to learn here that it is only passed along uh, by the laying on of the apostles' hands, just as we saw in Acts chapter 6. And this is really going to get the attention of Simon. Um, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me uh, to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said might come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken of the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now let's think uh, consistently about this. If the miraculous gifts, including the speaking in tongues, if the miraculous gifts were only passed along by the laying on the hands of the apostles, there are only 12 apostles at this point. There will be the late born apostle, uh, Paul, who passes along uh, the gifts as well. We find in Romans chapter 1, he says, I, I want to come and visit you so that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you. He couldn't do so in writing. He couldn't do it from a distance. He had to come and lay hands on them. And many people received uh, these miraculous gifts uh, by the laying on, on the hands of uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, but if this is true, and the Bible says that it is, then the miraculous gifts died. They ceased, just as Paul foretold in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They ceased when either the last apostle died, so no one else, they could lay hands on no one else, or the last person upon whom they had laid hands and gifted uh, in this way died, whichever came later. That's when the miracles ceased. These miracles uh, that were specific to confirm the word of God. Now it was at about that time that the New Testament was completed. And now they had what they needed, the confirmed word of God. And so it served its purpose. The church also was more well established. It served its purpose. And now we read of these things and either we believe or we reject. But again, we find even this internal threat was dealt with. It was dealt with quickly. And if Simon repented as a wayward Christian, then he would be back in the light and his sins would be washed clean. So now we have Philip. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And there is a miraculous uh, sequence of events, and it's an amazing sequence of events here that is so important for us to see and to understand. Um, it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversion here. Uh, you have um, a seeker, as we would call them today. Uh, you have a man of some means because he possesses the scriptures, and these are the Old Testament scriptures, and those were not cheap. They were handwritten. The... Uh, texts uh, were so precise that a scribe, if you told him what, what page and passage of scripture, he could tell you what any character on that page was supposed to be. And they would double check this and see in the middle that it had to be a precise character at a precise point or they would burn the page. So they knew these scriptures inside and out. Well, that's not a, uh, an easy undertaking. They could not email them. They could not download them. They could not copy them on the, the copy machine and pass them out. They could not go to the Bible bookstore and buy them. These were uh, rare in so many cases. It's amazing. They were So many were preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But this man possessed a copy of the scriptures, at least Isaiah, because that's what he's reading from. 
He had been to Jerusalem because that's what pious Jews did. He was returning to his queen, Candace of Ethiopia. Because pious Jews went back to where they lived, apart from the festival times. And as he's traveling in his chariot, he's reading the scripture. This is a man who is uh, in tune with God. He is desiring the things of God. You can imagine that he has been praying to God and God hears his prayers. And God answers his prayers and orchestrates uh, this encounter. An angel of the Lord said to Philip in verse 26, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. We know this area is the, uh, the Gaza Strip now. It's a, an area of much contention. Uh, it's an area that belongs to the Palestinian Authority now. But it lies between um, Israel and Egypt. And it's a deserted place, but it's a very well-traveled place and that roadway that leads there because that was a major trade route. Um, this is a desert place. And he arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian and a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all the treasure. Um, he was uh, come from Jerusalem to worship. He was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? Now, can you imagine a lot of people would take tremendous uh, offense at this? But, but look at what is happening here. He's reading this passage and he has questions. He does not understand. How did Philip know that? Again, this is the miraculous working and direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God working uh, in this man. He said, how can I unless someone guides me? That's an openness, a willingness, and an honesty with the scriptures. Again, he didn't recoil. Going, of, course, of course I understand this. You know, who are you? Be on your way. I'm an important man. You're some kind of wandering nomad. No, no, no. How can I understand this? The passage he was reading was this, and it comes from Isaiah 53. It's the suffering servant passage. It's an amazing passage. And when we look at this and consider this, he said, like sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generations? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or someone else? And take note, and if you write in your, your Bibles, um, or highlight, highlight this. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. Now, the very next thing he says, they're going along to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Why did he ask that question? Because preaching Jesus includes preaching baptism. It is part of the gospel. It's an integral part of the gospel. That was a very natural question if the full gospel was preached to him. But how do you preach baptism from an Old Testament text that has nothing to do with immersion in water? Because preaching that, answering his question, Philip answered the implications of that as it pertains to Jesus and also this man. Because he preached to him about the suffering servant uh, of Israel. This is not about Isaiah. This is about someone who was to come. This is about somebody who was rejected and despised by his people. He came to them offering them something, but they turned him away. He was nothing in his physical appearance that would draw people to him. But there were people drawn to his message. And yet he was forsaken. Justice truly was denied to him. But he came that we might have justice. That his sins, our sins, excuse me, were taken upon him. And he was numbered with transgressors. He was beaten. He was mauled. All for our sake. For Philip's sake, for the Ethiopian eunuch's sake, for your sake, and for my sake. And in preaching Jesus, 
We preach his death. We preach that death on a cross. But he was taken down from that cross. Once that sacrifice had been made, because it wasn't just about carrying our transgressions there, it was about atoning for those transgressions. And all of this in just richness and uh, prophetic language is described in Isaiah 53. God accomplished at the cross everything that he wanted to accomplish, everything that he needed to accomplish. And so now, Philip, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go preach the gospel to every creature. If you have a crowd of a thousand or if you have the crowd of one, it's the same gospel. And preach the gospel to them. And preaching the gospel includes preaching baptism. He told him of Jesus' death and of Jesus' burial and of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He told them of the need for his repentance, his death to sin. He told him of his need to confess the lordship of Jesus Christ, his, his uh, death to himself, to take up your cross, to deny yourself daily and not be ashamed of Jesus before men so that when Jesus comes again, he will not be ashamed of you, that you need to be joined together with Christ in the waters of baptism. The water is not miraculous. The baptizer is nothing more than an undertaker who is burying someone else. But there's a sinner and a savior who are joined together in the tomb. And Acts is instructing us and teaching us all throughout, with each uh, individual conversion, with each mass conversion, teaching us more and more what that gospel means to us and that gospel that we must teach and preach to everyone that we meet. And he says again, what hinders me? The natural question of a true and honest seeker answering the full gospel is to desire to obey it. And that's what he desires. But when we, we look at this and, and you look at your translations, be real careful here. Because this is a place, uh, in my translation, it jumps from verse 36 to verse 38. Some translations omit this, some translations include this, but verse 37, that should be in all of these, there's enough textual evidence for it. Verse 37, he calls upon him to confess the name of Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, then you may. Why is that omitted in some manuscripts? I don't know. Was it added into some, being absent from the others? I don't know. But the totality of the gospel and totality of scriptures tells us that at least it should be in there, whether it was originally in the text or not. I'm not arguing one way or the other. But that's why your, your Bible may go from verse 36 to verse 38 without mentioning that. Because watch what happens next. And he commanded the chariot to stop. That would be the Ethiopian. And they both went down into the water. That's necessary for immersion. I've heard people argue that there was a way station there and there was a jug of water for uh, travelers to, to take a small drink from. And that taking that, he sprinkled him. That's an absurd reading into the text that is not necessary. They both went down into the water. And it's necessary, again, for immersion. And this was a desert place. The Holy Spirit even guided them to a proper location. Not having a water supply right next to where you are is no excuse for obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. If this is truly what you believe and you're convicted in this, you'll do whatever it takes. We've driven miles in Panama to do this. We have such luxuries here in this country. You can always find a swimming pool, a, a lake, a river, bathtub in your home, or a baptistry in a church building. The, the location doesn't matter. The water doesn't matter. It's a sinner and a savior. And that's all that matters. And watch watch how that subtly is, is, um, is emphasized to us here because of what happens. Again, notice how this happens. All these things are fascinating. 
uh, to notice the little details that Luke includes for us. So they went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Can you imagine that scene? You have this guy runs up to your chariot. You're curious about the scripture that you're reading. He explains it, answering your questions. He teaches you the gospel and challenges you to obey. You say, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? They both go down into the water. He baptizes him and Philip is carried away by the Holy Spirit. He disappeared. And the unit goes on his way rejoicing. It's something important for us to know and to see and to understand. Philip was not important other than delivering the message. Philip was not important other than being the, uh, the, the man who buries a spiritually dead man. And now we have this man going on his way rejoicing. Because now he is one with Christ and he's going back home. He has been united with the body of Christ. And he's a member of the Lord's church. Philip found himself in Azarus. As he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. But Saul. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that he might be, that if he might find any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so now we have another external threat that follows a period of growth, a time of rejoicing. The gospel is now being spread and carried all the way down to Ethiopia. Philip is just keeping on, keeping on, preaching the gospel wherever he goes. And Saul is ready to ratchet up breathing out threats and he encounters the Lord Jesus and that's where we'll pick up next week but again notice the importance of these cycles that are going through this whatever comes at the church we need to be ready for it we need to be able to weather the storm whether it's from inside or from outside but we must never allow ourselves to be distracted from who we are and our purpose in this life. May God bless you all. We'll rejoin this again next week.